Hello, everyone. We're so glad you could join us this morning on this beautiful October morning in Plainfield, Sunday, October 4th, 2020. And we are recording from the Plainfield, New Jersey, from the um, United States of America, Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. Our subject today is unreality, and we are so grateful you could join us. And we will start with our morning prayer. Good morning. I'm reading today these words by Clara Scott from the 1800s. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Open my mouth and let me bear tidings of mercy everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Open my mind that I may read more of thy love in word and deed. What shall I fear while yet thou dost lead? Only for thy light from thee I plead. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. Thank you, that was beautiful, and that is something our little chorus groups sings on Sundays at times. And I, I did want to mention before we a couple things before we get into the watching point. And that is Peter, many of you have heard of Peter. He did the CD with Faith. Um, he wrote all those songs. They've recently done another CD, which, which is why he is visiting us for a few days. He's leaving this afternoon, but he's here in church and he's going to sing with Faith today. And he grew up in our Sunday school and played the organs when he started out as a teenager um, playing, played for many years. A very kind, sweet, loving, good soul as well as very musical. And we're just so happy to have him here today. A few years ago, he moved to California, Southern California. So we don't see him so much. So we're happy he's here for a visit. And the other, I wanted to share something with you. This is something that um, Linda found in Precepts 2. Um, our last liberator had a lot of various things. I decided to change the, the title from Citizens of the World. I thought True Governance was a better description of the magazine, and it was just something Gary happened to say. And I said, wow, that's really what we're trying to say in that particular liberator. And if we'd had it beforehand, we probably would have included this Gilbert Carpenter, Precepts 2. The church militant may be in the last analysis an unreal concept, but it serves a good purpose in Christian science. Therefore, it should be made as permanent as the last demonstration to be made in tearing down the temple of matter, so that it will remain until the end of mortal illusion. Mrs. Eddy wrote that the church must be properly chartered and the whole proceeding be made strictly legal. She knew that the laws of our country are foundational. Thus, if the Christian Science Church in its human expression is supported by the Constitution of the United States of America, it has the greatest chance of perpetuity of anything man-made. It will remain until the last stone of the temple is torn down. Once a typhoon swept over a tropical island, the only survivors were natives who clung to the oldest and largest trees. Those who took refuge in the church, which was built of stone, were drowned. Mrs. Eddy selected the most enduring thing that our country has produced, namely its constitution for her cause to cling to. 
This will be the last belief to be overcome and the world will be ready for spiritual freedom when demonstration has been carried that far. This is why we must protect and cherish our Constitution. It's why some of us here took a course on it so we know what it is, so we're not deceived when people say things that it is not. Exactly. And did you want to comment? No, I mean, the Constitution of the United States was really a very big step of progress for mankind because it was the first form of government since the very early uh, Israelites to be based on the rule of law where the law itself is based on divine law. It was just a huge step of progress. It was, a, it, some considered it a big experiment. Some consider it still a big experiment, but it is an ideal that we strive for. And that is why we protect it and keep its spiritual significance to the best that we can. Yeah, and it is why, as, as was said, and is, is being brought out in our Liberator magazine, it was the birthplace, the cradle of Christian science. And Gary said many times, Christian science couldn't have sprung up in any other country. This doesn't, this isn't bashing other countries, we're just stating facts. So it's just how it was and how it is. And this is why it must be protected and um, all that it is be protected. And those who, who came up with it, because it was not easy if you've read the history, the struggle for that independence and the writing of it. Which is why proper self-governance is essential to the future of mankind, because it is essential for the prosperity of Christian science. The two go hand in hand. Yes. I, I'm, I feel it's, it was given because this country was built on divine principle. Is the only way it could go forward and be the beacon on the hill for the rest of the world. And Mrs. Eddy writes here, from lack of moral strength, empires fall. I think that's why he said that, and I think that's why Adam says that the Constitution was written for moral people. Yes. So it's a, I feel it's in practice of it and, and not defiling it is how it stands. Thank you very much. Exactly, which is why we clearly understand that 1776 was the beginning of this country. It was not 1619. It was 1776. And there's been a shaking of the nations, as in Haggai, because of our lack of morality, our lack of God. And we're being shaken to the core right now to make sure we all ourselves right with him and with each other, as our brothers, and follow the... Uh, Follow the, Follow the golden rule, which is, as Florence said, all of this is the basis. If we don't do this, we will lose it. And, yeah, we've made made mistakes. We fought wars over one of our huge mistakes. But we learn, we progress, and we grow. And so, anyway, anybody else want to comment on that? Yes, uh, I think that's why each one of us, it's imperative to know what the Declaration of Independence says, what the Constitution says, because uh, right mm -hmm. now those mile-high piles of laws and paperwork are actually burying and obscuring the Constitution as it was meant to be, just as ecclesiastical religions uh, carry the true Word of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And that's why if anybody's interested, Hillsdale College has uh, online a course in the Constitution that is really very, very good. And it's worth, if you're interested in knowing what the Constitution really is and how it came about, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a good course to take. It's a simple, but I'm sure there are other courses, too, that, you know, um, just as long as it's 
factual. And so, okay. All right, we will go to the watching point, Linda. Watch number 177. Watch that you remind yourself every day that the action of truth is always to preserve reality and to destroy unreality. Then you will know that when the action of divine love seems evil to you, it is because you are still identifying yourself with unreality. The furnace destroys the dross and refines or liberates the gold. If you ally yourself with the dross, the action of truth must seem evil to you. If, however, you identify yourself with good, you know the action of good to always be blessed, since it is freeing the spiritual idea in you. This watching point defines the wrath of God as the blessed action of truth destroying unreality, seeming to be wrathful only to those who love and cling to unreality. Mrs. Eddy's instructs us to declare ourselves and others to be spiritual and immortal and to understand that we are so. In this way, we escape the ordeal of going through the illusion of destruction along with the dross of error. We identify ourselves with what we believe to be real. To see error in another as real is to identify ourselves with it. End quote. Any comments? Well, it was pretty clear. To, the instruction is to identify ourselves and others as good. And doing this liberates the spiritual idea. And this goes along with the conversation we had before about the Constitution, that it was for a moral people. Hence the great importance to be a moral people. And then if we do that, then the spiritual idea is liberated and is free to work in our experience. Thank you. And hence, well, we're going to get in, into all this. Hence the importance of what we do here, you know, and, and of church, the right concept of church. It's very interesting the way Gilbert Carpenter worded what he said, because he knows all of this is eventually going to go <laughs> as it, it approaches more and more the ultimate spirituality. So, anyway. Eventually, but who knows when. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's watching point 82. We talked about how the human symbols... You know, we, we will grow out of them, but we need them now. So. Yeah, we need them now. And I think back to my life before coming here, and I, I, it actually makes me laugh now because I think I was desperately trying to be unreal. I mean, that's, that's basically what it was because I wasn't following God, and I didn't know what the, you know, I didn't know Christian science. So that's why I felt like everything was unraveling and I was lost because I was just going completely the wrong way. So it's just funny to see that now, <laughs> you know, and realize why, why Christian science is so important. Thank you. Well, that's true, and that's true for everybody, because look around us. How many people are desperately trying to find comfort and security yes. Yes. in that which can't, can't provide it? Mm -hmm. Whether it's you know financial a, a job financial you know medicine uh, psychiatry wherever they cannot provide the security that people are desperately seeking for and this watching point gives us a clue as to what it means to love thy neighbor as thyself think about it. Yeah. What does it mean to love thy neighbor as thyself? This watching point speaks to it. I'm going to have um, Carol read this. There's something that Anne, our friend Anne in England, sent us a testimony. Um, and she was wondering where to submit it. It, it. it goes along with the watching point this week. So I think it's 
It's beautiful, and Carol will read it for us. You can start it where I have it. Okay. While considering the watching point today, the last line jumped out at me. To see error in another as real is to identify ourselves with it. This reminded me of a paragraph on page 122 in my copy of Collectania of Items by and about Mary Baker Eddy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mrs. Eddy passed a drunken man in Lynn and turned to the one with her and said, if that is the man I see, that is the man I am, and I refuse it because it is not the man I wish to be. The man was healed. This, in turn, brought to mind an experience recounted in the Century of Christian Science Healing from March 1928. When I first heard of Christian Science, I had been a confirmed drunkard and smoker for nearly 20 years, and, incredible as it may seem, I had not been sober for two years. I had often tried to conquer the craving for strong drink, but I had failed utterly and had become such a slave to it that I almost lived on it, taking very little else. Fear that I might sometime be unable to obtain drink has frequently caused me to hide the bottles of beer in the ash, in the ash bin. My habits had reduced me to a physical wreck, but even this was only part of the misery. For years, our home had been a habitation of discord. My husband was a drunkard and had frequently caused me very serious injuries when under the influence of drink. Finally, he found it impossible to live with me and left me, saying he would never return. This caused me to be penniless, and at the time of which I write, my only possessions were a pot of beer and the rags in which I was clad. My bed, furniture, and clothing had been sold or pawned to buy drink. The house in which I lived was empty, and although it was winter time, I had neither food nor fire. My relatives and neighbors shunned me, and my loneliness and misery were such that I had tried to end my life, but had been prevented. That was my condition when a lady, who I afterwards found was a Christian science practitioner, knocked at my door to make some inquiry. She did not know me and knew nothing of my plight, but at once I but at once saw that I was ill, and her comforting remarks caused me to tell her my tale of woe, which I concluded by saying that no one cared for me. My visitor instantly replied, but God cares for you, and I care for you. God is your father and mother, and he loves you just as he loves us all. He supplies all your needs and gives you health and happiness. At that moment, all craving for drink left me, and I was healed physically and morally. I was conscious of a sense of love and peace and hope that I had never known before. The lady asked if I would pour out the pot of beer, and I immediately did so having no desire for it. She then purchased a supply of food and clothing for me and left me until the following day when my husband returned home. He told me that on the previous day, when about to enter into a beer house, he felt that he could not go in and found that all desire for drink had left him. And he suddenly turned to return home. I'm sorry, and he suddenly longed to return home. He was astonished to find me changed into a happy woman, healed of all my sickness, as well as of the drink and tobacco habits. Neither of us has ever touched a drink from that day to this, and it is now six and a half years since we were healed. 
Though my husband was 20 miles away, he was healed at the same time and as quickly as I myself, and his character was also instantly reformed. I am now a well woman, leading a normal and happy life. My husband, relatives, and friends are all restored to me, and our home is now one of peace, harmony, and love. Mrs. Sarah Ellen Walker. Todd Morden, Yorkshire, England. Should I finish? No, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is what the touch of truth does. And if you think it's not happening now, it is. It is. And sometimes it doesn't take much. It's just the light shining on that darkness. Um, someone, I, I was actually going to maybe read parts of this at a Wednesday, and I didn't bring bring it with me today, but I, I, it goes along with this story. Someone who writes quite a bit on our YouTube station, and um, she got fired up because someone, I, I forget what the, the reading, it was Gary reading oneness or one of those. Anyway, someone said it, it, on the YouTube comment, well, it was a good remedy for insomnia. <laughs> so anyway, she, this person got very fired up over that comment, and she started list, listing all the healings that she has had by just listening to these audios that we have, including oneness. And I think at one point I did read one of her testimonies where she was up in the middle of the night listening and she realized she'd been deaf for I don't know how long and her, her hearing came back. And then also she said her ex-husband, whom she hadn't heard from in years, when she was having all this healing going on in her life, suddenly he began calling her and even offered to buy her a home. But this, this is what it does if you accept it and you let it enter some of you have been here for so long or have gotten kind of jaded or just don't expect healing. You know, you just, you got to rouse yourself. Remember what it was like when you first felt it. You first felt that light shining on you, how powerful it is. It's a resurrection power, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It can do anything and it will but we must keep this in our hearts and keep it working in our hearts so we um, we don't ever get old. The, the lesson says this week that your love will do what? Wax cold. Your love waxes cold, right? You don't have that enthusiasm and joy for it. Very, very good. Got to keep that fire. Which is also why we do what we do week after week, month after month, year after year, to keep it glowing and alive. And another dear friend in um, California, she sent me, and it was a commentary about the engrafted word and in this week's lesson and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls and then she writes this gratitude note this acknowledged for us the importance of Bible study and I deeply appreciate the emphasis of the Plainfield Christian Science Church independent places on such thank you for your love for and work with God's word is found in the Bible and the works of Mary Baker Eddy. And in this commentary, it's entitled, How Can I Graft God's Word into My Life? And it says, Have you experienced the futility of trying to produce spiritual fruit by your own efforts? If you redirect your energies to engraft scripture into your life and meditate it on it day and night, God's word will successfully bear good fruit in your life. Now that word, in graft, you look it up, it means to plant firmly and to establish. And that word establish, which I love because I, when I looked it up years ago, it says to settle or fix what is wavering, doubtful, and weak. And believe me, 
especially at that time, I had a lot that was wavering, doubtful, and weak. <laughs> Concerning God's word. <laughs> yes. And how many times, I haven't looked it up, but just look up that word establish. It's all over the Bible, right? God's going to establish. He'll establish you. He'll establish you. Well, he will settle or fix what is un what is wavering, doubtful, or weak. And then it also says to settle permanently. Once that work is done, it's permanent. You're not going to go back to this doubtful, weak, wavering person. But it's the engrafted word. So this article says to engraft scripture means to make it a living extension of your life so that it can produce spiritual fruit in you. And there is value in engrafting every single verse in the Bible. For example, if you engraft 1 Corinthians 13 and continue to meditate on it, it will produce the fruit of genuine love in your life. For that beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful chapter on love. Very famous and well-beloved yes. and known because of the value in that chapter. <laughs> If you engraft the book of First Peter, it will bear the fruit of patience during suffering. If you engraft Romans 6 and 8, you will have victory over sin. As you memorize and meditate on Christ's commands, you will demonstrate your love for God. You will be his friend, and you will know his love. Most of all, Christ will reveal himself to you through these commands. As you see the need for spiritual fruit in your life, humble yourself before the Lord. He will give you grace to carry out the steps to engraft the scripture. And then the, the first step in engrafting God's word in your life is to receive the living word, Jesus Christ, as your Savior and Lord. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living word. And then you feed upon the word of God. And he goes into saying, God compares his word to food, thus confirming our need to feed upon it daily. He calls, you know, the word as milk for new, the newborn baby requires. It's a requirement. It's not optional. And then you read it. He says it's important to read it both extensively and intensively. And there is a rich reward in reading the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now, there was that wonderful testimony on Wednesday someone from California wrote how she had learned here to, to do this read, Science and Health, Prose Works, and the Bible from start to finish, something we've talked about for years in this church. This is why. You think of all the other garbage you can is accessible to you, how we're always looking on our phones and everything. We'll spend at least a portion of that time reading these most important books and that's engrafting the word and then it says focus on very various passages as you read the Bible certain passages will stand out to you they will have special application to your life because of decisions you are making goals you are establishing questions you have or pressures you are facing engraft these passages into your soul so that God can transform your mind your will and your emotions through them. Again, it's what we're taught here. Many times a practitioner will give you statements of certain statements to engraft on your being because of a certain problem that you're having. But then you've got to do the work. You know, the, the practitioner, it's a duet we've been taught here. You just It's not this magic waving of a wand. You have to do the work as well as a practitioner. And then memorize the passages. Then you become equipped to meditate on it at any time, day or night. It's true. Maybe you're out in the, you know, a line somewhere at the grocery store and you need a passage of truth. If you memorize it, it'll, it'll overcome you. Or a hymn. Or something. And then ask questions about the passage. That's what many of you are doing now. The, the forum has gotten a little light the past few weeks. I don't usually like to bring this up, but make sure you're all being active in this kind of work as you read the lesson. 
look up things, ask questions. What does this mean? What does that word in graft mean? And as an idea comes to you that helps you, share it with others. Yeah, mm -hmm. as, as these <clears throat> folks did. Meditate. Hello. Yes. Hi, this is Ingrid. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for bringing um, that the love of many will wax cold. Uh, and it also says why right there. Yes. It says because iniquity, I'm not sure the, the exact wording, if someone has it, but because iniquity reign. Shall abound. Like Shall abound. Yes. So thank you for bringing that, and, and we can see the iniquity abounding, and that's why. <laughs> yes. You know, the love wax cold. And um, this is in every department of life. We can see it. And uh, just wanted to bring that back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid. Yes, that whole Matthew 24, this lesson has been so timely this week, but it, it talks about, I, um, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled. For all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. And then kingdoms rising against kingdoms, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. People betraying one another, hating one another, false prophets. Yeah, and because of this iniquity, we will wax old. And many shall be offended. Yes. <laughs> That's... Oh my! <laughs> Every, everybody's offended. Have you noticed? Everyone will all be offended. You've offended me. I'm offended. Everyone's offended. <laughs> I used to read that and think that was kind of an odd thing to put in there, but, <laughs> but now we see it very clearly. Yeah. Very clearly. Yeah. And that's that's why you go back to taking offense, unless the offense be to God, and there's nothing that can offend a whole-souled woman. Be aware of being offended. What well, Jesus said, you know, you all are offended at me. People are offended at, at the his word of science. His disciples, he asked his disciples if they were offended by him because he felt that they were. Mrs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eddie, once is it, Julia Bartlett, will you leave me too? And she was the last one because many were offended by her. Go ahead, Ingrid. And, and also that those iniquities come because the love has worked cold. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And that that brings us to, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of, man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. How many people are trying to play God and govern your life? Exactly. Sometimes you can't put a one person's name on it, but it's just an atmosphere. Oh, well. Yes. Well, well there are a lot of people who, who want the federal government to govern them, right? Oh, boy, yes. There are a lot of people who believe that that is, that that is their God. <laughs> Socialism is an alternative religion for a lot of people. I, don't, I told um, my a bit ago that seemed like America was becoming a land full of middlemen because so, uh, of that testimony I gave about <laughs> and that guy gave me a call saying that he wanted to talk to me and then when he talked to me he was just setting up another call of like oh. well how many people need to be in this chain this is foolish <laughs> so. right right that's why we teach the divinity course here too where you have direct teaching from God your father to tell you 
what to do and how to do it. And that absolutely means us as well, too. If something doesn't hit you right, then <laughs> that's between you and your God. You have a you have a right to have that. Everyone should have that right. But the more we give that right away, thinking we're getting something, well, then we are in trouble. And Mrs. Eddy talks about the reign of Adam starts mildly. You don't know it's happening until, whoops, everything's gone. That is what it means to be a moral society. Yeah. I think all the isms are not right for man, the man so, of God. So. Yeah. Beware of Thank isms. You. It also indicates that falling away that they talked about earlier. You know, you have a right to have your connection with God. Don't fall away from that connection. Because if you maintain it, the evil won't come. Won't have a room to come in. That's right. Well, and, and, and that's because not only is it a right, it's an obligation. Yes. It's an obligation. If you want to live in freedom, that's the only source of freedom. Because what is the price of liberty? Persecution. No. <laughs> Eternal. Eternal diligence. Vigilance. vigilance. Eternal vigilance. This isn't exactly uh, the place that Ingrid was talking about, but I found this uh, paragraph very helpful this week. And when I came across it, it's page 446 in Science and Health, and the little subheading for this uh, paragraph is Iniquity Overcome. Resisting evil, you overcome it and prove its nothingness. Not human platitudes, but divine beatitudes reflect the spiritual light and might heal the sick. The exercise of will brings on a hypnotic state detrimental to health and integrity of thought. This must therefore be watched and guarded against. Covering iniquity will prevent prosperity the ultimate trump, triumph of any cause. Ignorance of an error to be re eradicated oftentimes subjects you to its abuse. Thank you. Very yes. good. Ignorance. Very good. Isn't that what you wrote about, Linda? Go ahead. <clears throat> it came from Gilbert Carpenter, Precepts 2. And he says, quote, A young student calls all affliction dark and struggles to overcome it just as he calls all harmony demonstration. He has not yet learned that the most deterring phase of animal magnetism is that which presents itself as human harmony or human good, because it would seek to make mortals so happy in hell, hell that they have, no intent, they have no interest in heaven. The following, the following parody illustrates this contrast be the, between human evil and human good, and it's a little poem that goes. It is easy enough to fight when the devil frowns and is vile, but the man with might is the man who can fight when the devil comes with a smile. Mm. <laughs> End quote. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mike. Um, and this is, this is one of the ways that the evil works. It presents everything. It offers you everything. It smiles. It's all pat you on the back. And mm. It'll, It'll also, take care of all of your needs for mm -hmm. you. And it'll also <laughs> stab in the back. So, <laughs> so and only your only protection is your spiritual sense. Just as Craig was saying, it can just be an atmosphere you feel. Uh-uh, I don't like it. I don't like it here. Something's wrong. This person, something's going on here. And that's why you develop it and how important that is. Once it's uncovered, then you can get to it. But it, it tries, it, it operates in darkness and deceit. So, so, and then when it's being uncovered, it will fight, 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 a cornered beast, screaming, mm -hmm. shouting, accusing you of everything. Joe, Joe writes about that too. It always will accuse you of what it is doing mm -hmm. in order to try to continue its lie. It's the accuser. It's the accuser. Thank you very much. So Gary was going to read what Parthens wrote about yeah, that. Yeah, Parthens wrote something. He's, he's quoting from a sermon that Mrs. Eddy gave in 1887. 
the title of her sermon was Key to Job. And he, he writes, quote, In his mortal agonies, Job's wife tempted him, saying, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But Job resisted this temptation of evil and rebuked his wife. Hereby we learn that Adam's estate in error, where the senses were supposed to supply him only pleasure, was more subtle than the pains of sense to mislead mortals. Adam yielded to the temptations of the flesh and thereby lost a sense of harmony. He had never possessed its science. While through the pangs of sense, Job was instructed and made able to resist the temptations of evil. End quote. Yes, and you know, all of this is, yes, Mrs. Eddy's writings, and and in Carpenter brings it out over and over again, and the, how human harmony is not what Christian science, it's not the ultimate by any means we are to overcome, because that human harmony is not harmony. It's a false sense of harmony. It's usually covering a ton of errors, which will eventually burst out in flames, which I think is, is partly what's happening in our country and maybe other countries as well. So uh, there, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Better to bring it out, to be healed. And this is handling it, confronting it, meeting it, not running from it, not avoiding it, but dealing with it. And thus, you prove it's unreality. So what, what is the definition of perdition? It's utter ruin and destruction. Okay, this is where all this is leading us, you see. <laughs> it ain't pretty, folks. <laughs> so um, let's, you know, let's stop it. And the earlier you stop it, the better off you are. And if you can stop it early on in your own life, then that's great. That's what you should be doing. Don't let it go on and on until, as is Eddie says, it'll enlarge its claims. The serpent becomes a red dragon. It doesn't make it any more real, but it seems more real. That's why your love wax cold, because <laughs> you got more to deal with. But that's okay, because the truth of it is, God's presence and power is the only power. And I love this, too, in Science and Health. Number five. Here we see how so-called material sense creates its own forms of thought, gives them material names, and then worships and fears them. With pagan blindness, it attributes to some material god or medicine an ability beyond itself. The beliefs of the human mind rob and enslave it, and then impute this result to another elusive personification named Satan. So, this definition of animal magnetism in our blue book on page 103, definition. Now think about the nameless nothing in this. Animal magnetism is starting a belief and getting others to fear it. Until evil is done, those that hold the belief, and a law is made, and the era goes on gaining ground until the serpent becomes a dragon. Isn't that wonderful definition of it? Start small. Start small. You start a belief. You get some belief. The nameless nothing. Get everybody to be absolutely scared to death of it. Until evil is done to those that hold the belief. It seems to manifest itself because people say, well, you know, what are you talking about? There it is. You know, it is a problem. Well, if you hold that belief and you're scared to death of it, in belief, it seems to appear like a mirage. And the era goes on, and then a law is made, a mortal law, a mortal mind law. And the era goes on gaining ground until the serpent becomes a dragon. And that is really what Mrs. Eddy is saying in that on page that I just read from Science and Health. 
on page 186. Creates its own forms of thought, gives them material names, and then worships and fears them. How lovely is that? But you see, if you see it, you can say, aha, I got you. I understand what a darn liar you are. And you won't trick me into believing and fearing and worshiping you because I worship the one God. Because that's what I read when I'm reading my Bible every day and my prose works every day and my science and health every day. And this is the process that Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24. Take heed that no man deceive you. Yeah, no thoughts. No thought deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. I am a vaccine. I am your savior. Well, what's that all about? Well, that's why no human will or any human way can correct the fear or, or help the fear. It has exactly. to be from running to God. Exactly. There was a great example of that that we didn't get to in that last Bible study where Saul, who was trying to uh, murder David, he uh, does it very openly. So... These errors don't have to come behind the scenes. It can be done very openly. He declares to his followers, Saul declares to his followers, that who is going to give you food and safety in this? Is it going to be me or is it going to be David? And uh, so that's how he gets them to be loyal to him because he's bribing them with, with their homes and their safety and their food. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And and in this, I thought it was really telling, Matthew 24. Jesus says, all of this stuff's going to happen, but the end is not yet. He says, but at the end there, he says, he, he that shall endure, the same shall be saved, and then the end shall come. And what is the end that he's referring to here? The end of mortal mind, of error. Yes. This is Eddie explains mm -hmm. in the last the citation of Science anymore. and Health. Mm -hmm. A knowledge of error and of its operations must precede that understanding of truth which destroys error until the entire mortal material error finally disappears. And the eternal verity, man created by and of spirit, is understood and recognized as the true likeness of his maker. That is the end that Jesus was referring to. And there is no other end. And I, I think it goes on continually and constantly as, you know, different uh, states and stages of being. Uh, you, you grasp more and more of this. And, and I love, too, where Mrs. Eddy has said, it's, and this is our answer. Science shows that all these material conflicting mortal opinions and belief emit the effects of error at all times. Okay, it's gone on all the time. Always has, always will, at least this period of time. But this atmosphere of mortal mind cannot be destructive to mortals and health when it is opposed how? Okay. Promptly. Persistently. Yes. It's work. Don't wait till tomorrow or for a better time. Right away. Right away. You knock it down fast and you keep at it. Don't get tired of it. Truth and love antidote this mental miasma and thus invigorate and sustain existence. So this is how we overcome the unreality that we seem to be faced with. Keep at it. And it's, it's a wonderful, it's a glorious warfare. But what is Mrs. Eddy says? The warfare with oneself is it's grand. It's grand. <laughs> yes. Well, and then, and this end that Jesus refers to, it comes to each one of us individually, doesn't it? Yes. It's like we don't have to look around us <laughs> <laughs> to see if the end is coming yet. It's within our own consciousness. That is how it works. Because that, our own consciousness, 
is what defines our reality. Yes, as, as Florence likes to say, what is your reality? Exactly. <laughs> and Florence, if you want to say, yeah, say, some, say something else. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, oh no, not really. I mean, I feel like the whole world is on fire because the dross of impurity has to be burned off. And that's why, of course, it feels uncomfortable, but we have to go through it in order to return to what it should be, how yeah. God has made his world and us. Yes. Exactly. And then, thank you, Florence. So we will end with something from Unity of Good. This is from Seed Time and Harvest by Mary Baker Eddy. Material and sensual consciousness are mortal. Hence, they must sometime and in some way be reckoned unreal. That time has partially come, or my words would not have been spoken. Jesus has made the way plain, so plain, that all are without excuse who walk not in it. But this way is not the path of physical science, human philosophy, or mystic psychology. The talent and genius of the centuries have wrongly reckoned. They have not based upon revelation their arguments and conclusions as to the source and resources of being, its combinations, phenomena, and outcome, but have built instead upon the sand of human reason. They have not accepted the simple teaching and life of Jesus as the only true solution of the perplexing problem of human existence. Sometimes it is said by those who fail to understand me that I monopolize. And this is said because ideas akin to mine have been held by a few spiritual thinkers in all ages. So they have but in a far different form. Healing has gone on continually, yet healing, as I teach it, has not been practiced since the days of Christ. What is the cardinal point of the difference in my metaphysical system? This, that by knowing the unreality of disease, sin, and death, you demonstrate the allness of God. This difference wholly separates my system from all others. The reality of these so-called existences I deny because they are not to be found in God. And this system is built on him as the sole cause. It would be difficult to name any previous teachers save Jesus and his apostles who have thus taught if there be any monopoly in my teaching, it lies in this utter reliance upon the one God to whom belong all things. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.